Welcome to the Asia Economist, a webinar series from DBS Group Research. I am Taimur Beg, Chief Economist. Today we will go over the situation and outlook in the bond market of emerging economies. And to do that, credit strategist Cheng Wei Liang will guide us through a series of slides, after which we will have a question and answer session. Wei Liang, welcome to the Asia Economist. Please take it away. Thank you, Taimur. For today's webinar, we'll be examining the outlook for EM sovereign credit in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So looking at slide two, everyone knows that COVID-19 has upturned both lives and livelihoods across the world. In turn, governments have ramped up fiscal spending globally to cushion the shocks to employers as well as workers. The natural question to ask is, what will be the impact to the public sector's fiscal position over the long term, with debt to GDP ratios rising beyond prudential norms of 60%. So to answer this question, we look at sovereign debt defaults in recent history and see what are the risk factors that could raise concerns on sovereignty. In turn, we assess today's environment with regards to those risks that we identify. We see whether vulnerabilities exist and if they do, how they can be mitigated. So we'll kick off by having a look at the amounts government, governments are spending on the next slide, number three. The chart on the left shows the size of new fiscal measures announced across major economies as a percentage of 2019 GDP. In aggregate, the world is directly spending 7.1% of GDP, and this does not include quasi-fiscal measures and guarantees that are still extending to businesses and households. The countries with deficits exceeding prudential limits of 3% of GDP include 8 out of 10 advanced economies and 5 out of 10 emerging market economies. And the size of global fiscal stimulus now is uh, unprecedented, is larger than what we have seen post the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. However, most countries were not actually successful in consolidating their fiscal positions after spending so much on stimulus uh, post the GFC. And the key reason is that structural growth and inflation have both slowed significantly in many economies, which made them very hard to grow out the, of the debt. So some Eurozone economies even have to restructure their debt as uh, they were shunned by debt markets. So the case right now is that many countries will now be budgeting larger deficits at higher debt levels than what uh, we see in 2007, just before the GFC. Is that a cause of concern? So let's see what markets think on the next slide. So on slide four, the, charts, uh, the chart on the left shows sovereign uh, credit default swap spreads or CDS spreads uh, after we normalize them based on five-year mean and standard deviation. And as you can see, at the start of 2020, CDS spreads for all the emerging markets listed here uh, were below the five-year average. However, when Italy declared a national lockdown in early March and it becomes clear that COVID-19 will be a global pandemic, there was a very sharp widening of CDS spreads to as high as three to five standard deviations above mean. So some of this have to do with the dearth of market liquidity as positions are unwind in global asset markets, but there's also a very clear palpable fear of fiscal deterioration. In particular, we see countries that are more dependent on oil and resources having the largest moves, namely Mexico and South Africa. Countries like Korea and China, considered to be fiscally strong, saw much smaller spread widening, even though they were the heart of the COVID-19 crisis. Over time, all these moves have retraced somewhat as market panic has subsided, but spreads for all EMs have not returned to their early March levels, with the exception of Korea. On the rating side, large fiscal stimulus and decline in revenues have also triggered downgrades from Mexico, South Africa, and recently India. On top of downgrades, many countries, including Brazil, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Thailand, also saw their rating outlooks lowered. So it is fair to say markets are now bracing for increased EM credit risk led by weaker sovereign positions. We review what happened in previous episodes of EM defaults in our next section. So on slide five, uh, this shows what we think are the risks that typically precede a sovereign debt default, not wanting to keep anybody in suspense. We list the three factors over here, declining commodity prices, extended external debt, and lastly, fears of devaluation. On slide six, uh, this chart 
shows the debt to GDP rate, uh, this shows the government debt in default uh, across time. Some of you may realize from an earlier chart that advanced economies debt to GDP are way higher than those of emerging market economies. Uh, estimates are about 120% for advanced economies, again 60% in yen. So why is it that the emerging market economies get into defaults much more frequently than advanced economies? Certainly debt to GDP is not everything. When investors think about rolling over credit sovereigns, they also consider institutional quality as well as policy credibility. So given the better quality of institutions and greater credibility in keeping inflation under control and keeping debt sustainable, the tolerance threshold for debt levels will be higher for advanced economies. Furthermore, households in higher income economies generally have higher net worth and they are quite willing to hold government debt. And so their countries typically do not need to borrow from, from foreigners, which is far more fickle group of borrow of creditors. So there's, if you look at the chart on the left, there's a notable spike of defaults in the 1980s that coincide with the Latin American debt crisis, which is really a rolling debt crisis for the region. Uh, if you see the checkbox on the, checkbox on the right, falling commodity prices and high external debt burdens were factors that have triggered defaults uh, during this period of time. And the next two largest default in the EN space are the 1998 Russian default and the 2001 Argentina default. So in both cases, devaluation fears arising from the fiscal deviance and an exchange rate pack were a material driver towards default. Although in both cases, uh, falling commodity prices and some external debt also played a role in triggering that. So we'll start off by looking at what went wrong in Latin America on slide seven. So Latin America in the 1970s mostly did quite well economically. The region recorded around 6% growth uh, over the decade. The Arab oil embargo of 1973 led to a surge in oil prices. So Venezuela and Mexico benefited being net oil exporters. Americans were also trying to diversify from Middle Eastern oil and then have directed policy support uh, for oil development in both countries. So both countries could get dollar loans easily and Mexico in particular was keen to tap on those loans to support its economy since its exports to the US has set, uh, partly as a result of the oil shock. Um, but on the other side of the aisle, Brazil and Argentina were both oil importers and have suffered, and, and they, they, they do suffer from higher import costs. Brazil ended up borrowing heavily from external creditors to make major infrastructure investment to see it through the oil crisis, running out a large current account deficit across the decade. However, growth was strong. It was helped by rising coffee prices and a resilient manufacturing sector. Argentine economic performance was actually the worst, uh, with growth of just 1.2% from 1973 to 1979. But even then, the private sector was able to obtain large external loans as credit access was, was fairly easy. So what we see is that even across countries with very different exposure to oil, external debt to GNI ratios have risen quite significantly from an average of 10 to 20% in early 70s to 30 or 50% in the late 70s. And then Volcker was appointed as a Fed chair in 1979. So before his appointment, as you can see from the chart on the right, real rates has been negative throughout most of the 1970s due to the elevated inflation from the period. Volcker, when on his appointment, declared war on inflation and high interest rates very sharply. Inflation begins to fall and real rates ended up positive in 1982 and continued rising. Now, most Latin American debt was in the form of short-term variable rate foreign currency loans. Let's see what happened to these loans on slide 8. So due to rising rates and a strong dollar, Mexico was the first in Latin America to declare it can't service its foreign currency debt in 1982. So at the time, there was an oil glut developing due to North Sea oil discoveries. Oil prices were falling until 1986. Mexico and Venezuela being oil exporters are understandably in trouble. But Brazil also couldn't get banks to finance its debt, as the Mexico's default has made all banks wary of solvency risk and more acutely aware of capital shortfall. Meanwhile, the sustained current account deficit 
of uh, Argentina led to it giving out its exchange rate stabilization policy in 1981. So that led to sharp devaluations, which worsened its external debt burden. The state was forced to take on a large proportion of private external debt in 1981 to 1982, but eventually that proves too much and they have to restructure its debt in 1986. So this was a very much a regional systemic crisis as access to international financing was very difficult between 1982 to 1990, making a lost decade for Latin America. And in this case, debt to GDP ratios were actually fairly reasonable. Most of them have a debt to GDP below 60%, which really does not suggest anything amiss. But vulnerabilities are actually pretty severe due to the external debt structure in the form of foreign currency variable rate debt. Moving to slide nine, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at Russia's 1998 debt default. So if you believe that a sovereign can always print money to repay its domestic currency obligations, you may have to think again, because in this case, Russia defaulted on its GKOs, which are the short-term domestic bills. But you'll be in good company, right? Because the Nobel laureates at the multi-billion dollar hedge fund also thought the same. And the key reason why there was no ability to print money was because the Russian ruble was packed to a narrow trading band against the dollar. So in, in economics, there is this idea of fiscal dominance versus monetary dominance, which was first proposed by Sargent and Wallace in 1981. So under fiscal dominance, the fiscal authority decides how much deficit to run, and the central bank can accommodate that by raising revenues via signal rush or changing price levels. But under fixed exchange rates, you really have a case of monetary dominance where the central bank decides what level of prices it commits to, and then the fiscal authority has to change its deficit to meet the budget constraint. So back to Russia, in 1998, there were fiscal deficits around 3%, uh, more than 3% of GDP, and the Duma has rejected fiscal consolidation measures. Markets being markets, they're very worried that it could lead to inflation and eventual ruble devaluation. So there was heavy speculative selling of the Russian ruble, and the CBR has to intervene heavily in FX markets. So this intervention came at the cost of tighter liquidity. Rates were rising quickly towards 50% compared to inflation of around 20 plus percent. So this only made the debt looks unsustainable, even though it was not really high compared to GDP. Debt auctions eventually failed, and a domestic debt restructuring was announced in August. Argentina also faces the same devaluation fears in 2000, 2001, as the Argentine peso was in a currency bought of the US dollar, like Hong Kong's case. But unlike Hong Kong, they didn't actually hold enough dollars to redeem all their pesos. So it's the same story, years of expanding fiscal deficits, no political appetite to do consolidation because growth was slowing, and at the same time, falling commodity export prices, uh, particularly soybean and corn prices. Credit spreads quickly widened as most of Argentina's debt was denominated in dollar terms. So in June 2001, Argentina tried to extend a portion of debt maturities beyond 2005 with a voluntary debt swap. But the discount rate on the debt swap was such a high interest rate of 17% that markets no longer thought Argentina's debt was sustainable by July 2001. Eventually, they have to default in December uh, peso was floated and lost about three quarters of its value. So in Argentina, there was this confluence of all three risk factors that we identified earlier. That of declining export commodity prices, high foreign currency external debt, and devaluation fears because of persistent fiscal deviance. So Argentina defaulted again on debt last year, but I think that's really a story for another day. Moving on to slide 10, what are the lessons from the past that we can apply in today's emerging markets? So let's first take a look at external debt vulnerabilities today on slide 11. The chart on the left is the ratio of foreign currency government debt against GDP for emerging Asia and three major EM debt issuers, Mexico, Brazil, and Russia. Clearly, most countries have very little foreign currency debt. So the emerging market world has changed a lot since the late 1990s and major economies have developed their local currency debt markets reducing reliance on short-term dollar debt. Indonesia and the Philippines have more notable levels of foreign currency debt relative to their GDP, but even then they remain under 12% of uh, GDP, which is a far cry from the late 1970s Latin American external debt levels. Also comparing across time, there was no significant trend in the structure of external debt 
uh, so you look at the ratios from 2012 and now they are almost similar to each other. More importantly, uh, the Fed's policy guidance now is as dovish as it gets. Powell has said that the Fed is not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, using this recursive rhetoric to underscore just how far away rate hikes are. So this gives EMs lots of space in a few ways. So for one, they could continue to get access to dollar debt at low rates if they need to. More importantly, they will find it easier to attract capital flows to their local currency debt markets, given the comparative view advantage. So capital inflows in turn should support EM currencies. But let's have a look at where EM currencies stand today on the next slide. So on slide 12, uh, we have a chart on FX DEAR valuations. We developed the DEAR, which is a DBS equilibrium exchange rate model, to as a gauge of whether a currency is overvalued or undervalued relative to long-term long fundamentals. So the chart on the left shows that uh, major uh, EM currencies are not significantly overvalued and they are all undervalued relative to the dollar, which ranks as the most expensive uh, based on our metric. Furthermore, EM current account deficits are generally quite modest, except for Brazil and Indonesia. But our models show that these currencies are not excessively overvalued at this juncture. And that could, that could mean some current account adjustment to come through in 2020, which means that vulnerabilities on the current account and currency fund is probably lower than it seems. Another point to note is that devaluation episodes of the past were often triggered by high inflation uh, alongside high public spending. But we look at, when we look at inflation today, most EMs actually have modest inflation, uh, with India and China just having some inflation that's a bit higher than their uh, target. But most, both countries also have small external debt due to strict regulations on onshore debt. So currency, currency depreciation, if that happens, they're not likely to transmit in the solvency stresses for the public sector. And also central banks can print money to meet debt obligations. Or can they? We take a look at that on the next slide. So if you recall our discussion of fiscal and monetary dominance earlier, the exchange rate regime matters a lot in terms of the ability for central banks to accommodate budget deficits via funding government bonds and loans. So emerging markets today have mostly transitioned to a free flow or managed flow which creates more degrees of freedom for them in terms of directly buying bonds. Given the huge amount of fiscal stimulus plan, one worry is how easily can this be financed without the help of central banks. And so central banks across major EM economies have stepped up, and we detail some of the actions they have done or are exploring in this table uh, on the slide. In Indonesia, BI has committed to buy up to 125 trillion rupiah of bonds in the primary market which is about 12% of the budget deficit for 2020. In the Philippines, the BSP has purchased 300 billion pesos of government bonds and has the authority to buy up to 540 billion or 35% of the budget deficit. Right now, there's also a discussion to raise this limit even further. In Thailand, the BOT has stepped up bond purchases to stabilize the market and has committed to lending the government 900 billion baht for funding loans to SMEs and for a corporate bond Stabilization, stabilization fund, which will be used to roll over corporate debt. India is buying long-term bonds and sh selling short-term bills, uh, which is a liquidity neutral move, and Brazil is also considering the same. They are moving more cautiously than other EMs since inflation remains somewhat of a concern uh, in the recent past. So the takeaway is that EM central banks need not be wholly focused on inflation targeting they could exercise some flexibility to keep government financing operating smoothly through this difficult time. But this does not mean that beyond extraordinary circumstances, such central bank support should continue. We do not think that it should be pure fiscal dominance or pure monetary dominance for that matter. As with all things in life, the middle way can be a right path. So this concludes my presentation and over to you, Timer. Thank you very much, William. Uh, it's an interesting times for uh, debt, no question about it. Um, you mentioned the lessons uh, one can take away from the Latin American crisis, uh, and also um, in both in the 70s, 80s as well as in the 90s. So just by way of background, I have a paper on the 
uh, Brazil debt crisis, where we look at the breakdown between resident and non-resident positioning of debt, asking the question that, you know, is there a way to figure out whether, you know, investors discriminate a country depending on their residency of origin? And what we found in the case of Russia 1998 was that it was a very resident-driven crisis, that the residents are the ones who lost faith in the currency and in the debt, and the external investors were sort of late to wake up, if you will which was very different in the case of the Brazil crisis, which happened the following year. So I suppose my first question to you is that when you look at the resident versus non-resident holding of Asian credit, uh, do you worry that uh, what we saw, for example, in March, when there was a massive capital outflow and that put pressure on credit all around the world, Asia not excluded, whether that sort of phase could come back and that Asia has outsized vulnerability to non-resident positioning? Right. So in Asia, there's actually a very broad spectrum of dependency uh, on external financing. So countries such as Indonesia uh, and India, they are, they, are, they are consistently running current account deficits. So naturally, a very big question is how these current account deficits are financed. Uh, in Indonesia's case, a very significant portion of uh, government bonds are actually held by non-residents. And that definitely uh, constitute a vulnerability to be aware of. So if we recall in back in March, the Indonesian rupiah actually saw a very steep sell-off, even though Indonesia uh, as a whole has very few COVID-19 cases at that point in time. So what actually happened was that uh, foreign investors or non-resident investors were quickly pulling money from the country's debt markets. They were more worried about uh, what's happening around the world than anything Indonesia specific in this instance. So that is definitely a vulnerability to consider uh, in certain parts of Asia. But for the other major economies in Asia, if you look at, for instance, um, for instance, uh, Korea, or in the case of Thailand, external uh, financing is definitely smaller. So non-resident holdings of government bonds in these countries, uh, they have been uh, relatively low levels. They, they are not likely to impact uh, bond yields very much, even if there is a foreign exodus, so to speak. So in terms of the disruptions to capital markets, in terms of the disruptions uh, to the currency, they tend to be an order of magnitude smaller uh, for the case of uh, Korea and Thailand. So uh, there's definitely a case to be made for some concern on uh, non-resident holdings, but also a need to be uh, aware of the differences in Asia. They are not uh, the same across the board. Let's talk a little bit about China, uh, you know, the largest issuer of debt uh, in, the, in the entire emerging market universe, if not the whole world. Um, what's your sense of uh, Chinese credit? Uh, let's start with the Chinese sovereign, uh, because we've seen a lot of institutional interest in Chinese sovereign debt in the last few months, and then talk a little bit about the big debt overhang in China and what it means for the credit outlook for China, high yield and investment grade. Right. So in the case of China, uh, they have been very cautious in terms of the fiscal, uh, uh, in terms of the fiscal uh, stimulus they had put out. So although they did step up uh, on the fiscal front, the size of the stimulus is not quite as large as what some people were expecting uh, earlier. Uh, the main reason is that a lot of the increased spending will not come through the central government uh, budget. It will mostly fall on local governments and provincial governments uh, to try to raise funding uh, for some of the infrastructure projects that they have earmarked and allowed to proceed uh, for this year. So in terms of the debt to GDP ratio, I think China's uh, amount of central government debt is, is likely to be manageable. It's still likely to warrant uh, an A rating, at least in the short term. Uh, so the real question is, what happens to the debt that are being taken on by the uh, provincial and local governments? So this amount of debt has increased quite significantly over the years, uh, partly because of the need to support economic growth that has been slowing since 2014, and also partly as a need to, uh, to, to ensure that infrastructure development can catch up with the rising living standards of Chinese uh, in, in, in China. So therefore, there's a bit of a conundrum. Uh, 
in terms of how exactly will the infrastructure projects plan out. So a lot of the debt, probably you can say uh, finance or relatively short tenors versus the payoff that you can get uh, from the infrastructure, which is likely to be multi-year or even multi-decade affairs. So my understanding is that right now, the Chinese domestic banks, they have sufficient liquidity uh, to, to, to finance a lot of the incoming local government bond issuance and that shouldn't really be a cause of concern at this point in time. And given that most of Chinese debt is actually owned domestically, they are, hope, they are held by residents, what that implies is that the risk of an outflow or a sudden turn in sentiment, that's not going to happen in China's case. So it's very unlikely that we will see a reassessment of China's uh, credit rating just because of the amount of uh, fiscal spending that have stepped up to combat this COVID-19 crisis. Um, the other part of the equation which Timer spoke about is on the private sector side. So how will the private sector adjust to this new reality? So there are some questions raised with regards to high yield debt in China, uh, particularly companies that have not been making profits for a number of years. They have seen profitability decline and furthermore they are hurt by the ongoing US-China trade tensions. Uh, external demand is not as strong as they it was back uh, five, five to ten years ago. And these companies, given the extensive debt burdens that they have, could be in trouble. But a vast proportion of high yield debt is actually issued uh, by real estate developers, right? So the key question is, how does China's real estate outlook look like from here? So I think DBS um, House is that we have a rather cautiously optimistic view. We believe that real estate sales will continue to hold up uh, as uh, the trend, secular trend of urbanization continues and as more and more Chinese uh, wish to move from rural areas in the cities, that's a trend that's likely to support the real estate market, uh, it's likely to enable uh, developers to continue marketing projects uh, to the wider public and ensure that they can demonstrate that the cash flows are very much uh, there. But of course, the kind of leverage levels that we see in the real estate sector is going to come down because uh, of what happened this year. So there's a lot more caution. Uh, some of the more ha highly leveraged developers have say, stated that they will want to try to bring down uh, leverage at the expense of profitability. So if that happens, I think it will bring uh, the real estate sector to a more sustainable and uh, perhaps a more healthy and resilient level compared to where they were in the past. So. Uh, on, that, on that note, I think vulnerabilities exist, but it's going to be very sector specific. Domestic oriented sectors will probably perform better versus sectors that are very much subject to vagaries or external demand, which is going to be quite soft due to the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, William, in slide 12, you showed the FX valuation, uh, you know, fantastic piece of analysis that you have been doing over the last six months or so. Um, and you show that the um, U.S. dollar on a fundamentals basis is overvalued and there is room for significant weakening of the U.S. dollar. This could, of course, act as a massive mitigating factor for emerging market credit, correct? So I think that's 100 percent correct. So when the U.S. dollar is on a weakening trend, what tends to happen is that capital flows to emerging markets pick up. Uh, investors are a lot more receptive. Uh, to EM credit, and that generally creates a very benign environment uh, for growth. And there's a bit of a, uh, we we'll say, a positive uh, reinforcement going on. So with the currencies uh, strengthening, uh, with inflows coming in, that tends to lead to lower rates, and lower rates in turn sub support uh, the economy uh, to recover to to higher uh, growth trajectory. But of course, the key risk is what happens if the uh, the Fed is to discover that, you know, maybe policy is a bit too accommodative, maybe they should tighten, and that is going to create, I think, a recipe for some disruptions. If you look back in 2013, uh, back then, uh, most participants in the markets were expecting the Fed to be on QE infinity. Uh, that's not really going to be an end to this policy accommodation. And what happens really surprised markets when Ben Bernanke said, you know, that a taper is going to happen at some point. Uh, we see an upheaval in emerging market currencies. And uh, that really, I think, highlights the importance of having some resilience and some 
buffers in terms of foreign exchange reserves to accommodate this kind of market volatility and at the same time not to get too stretched in terms of external debt uh, burdens. But you know, volatility is volatility, it will always be there as long as uh, the country's fundamentals are relatively resilient, uh, this stage would, can be accommodated uh, by either central bank interventions or by a more uh, counter cyclical policies and capital flow uh, management tools. Right. Um, finally, William, in terms of Southeast Asia, uh, we saw Indonesia suffer a lot in February, March, come back fairly strongly in recent months. And you've shown early in a slide as far as the CDS of Southeast Asian economies are concerned, they've compressed a lot. So what's the outlook for the rest of the year? Have we seen the best or better stuff is yet to come? So I would say the Fed has, uh, has created a very conducive picture for EMs at this point. Uh, of course, risks still remain, right? Particularly, uh, we are still at a stage where countries are grappling with the fallout from COVID-19. Right now, most loans, uh, most banks have uh, introduced a low moratoriums. Uh, they are not actively uh, calling back credit from their customers, uh, which is a good thing, by the way. But at the same time, there's no real way to gauge what is the damage that has been wrought on the corporate sector, uh, what is the uh, shortfall in capital is going to look like. So I think there's still some uncertainty on that front, but these worries are likely going to be pushed out to maybe 2021 or so, uh, given the fact that right now it's all about uh, addressing the impact of the crisis and not so much in terms of uh, measuring what sort of uh, uh, losses that economies and companies have taken because of it. So for now, for the rest of the year, our outlook is that it's going to be a very benign situation. Uh, we still think that dollar Asia is likely to ease a little more, even though it's eased quite a fair bit from uh, its peak in, in March, uh, given the fact that uh, credit concerns are going to be somewhat of a different issue. So the Fed has been very successful in transforming a very urgent uh, short run crisis in liquidity to a very slow moving uh, insolvency uh, crisis or insolvency risk. So there's less concern on the market's part on whether or not uh, liquidity tensions is going to return as what we saw in March. Uh, rather, the main concern is what are the losses that are likely to fall on companies? Uh, what is the amount of capital that banks may or may not need to raise in future? But all this question can be addressed slowly uh, by counter cyclical tools. Uh, they can be addressed slowly by governments. But at some point, of course, government support will have to cease, right? So uh, the question is what companies will be deemed uh, to be worth for saving and what companies will be left to fail? I think that's a question that markets will confront at some further point in time. Uh, We're not completely out of the woods on that. Right. I think that's a critical point to end on. Uh, we have gotten a lot of support and proverbial sort of bailout as far as liquidity is concerned from the Fed. And beyond the Fed, global central banks have also played a very heroic role. Uh, but at the same time, we're certainly not out of the woods and credit concerns are not going to go away, uh, especially as we pick up the pieces from this crisis and get a sense of, you know, which businesses stay and which businesses go. Uh, we haven't talked about developed market credit, but already in the U.S., for example, we have seen some debt defaults and corporate bankruptcies. And I fear that this is the tip of the iceberg. So we will keep our seatbelts fastened and wait for your continued insights. Uh, Chang Wiliang, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Tim. It's a pleasure. It's been great to have you. Uh, thanks to our listeners for their time as well. Uh, you can find all of our publications and multimedia by Googling DBS Research Library.